Hey everybody, this is Autoblog Podcast producer Eric here. I'm just hopping in quickly at the beginning of the episode to let you know that this episode of the Autoblog Podcast is brought to you by the SoFi Daily Podcast. Reaching financial independence starts with having the right information. So every weekday morning, SoFi keeps you up to date with important business news and stock market happenings and how they affect your financial life. So get your money right and search for SoFi, that's S-O-F-I, wherever you get your podcasts. On with the show. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Autoblog Podcast. I'm Greg Migliori. Joining me today on the phones is Associate Editor Byron Hurd. What's going on, man? Hey, I'm doing all right. How about yourself? Doing great. Doing great. We got a great show for you guys today. Uh, we're going to run through a lot of different things. Some things Byron's been driving, and he's been driving quite a few, quite a few things, uh, including the Audi Allroad, the Mazda CX-9, and my personal favorite here, the Shelby Mustang GT350R uh, kind of buried the lead there. We'll probably talk about that one first, actually. Um, I've been driving the Kia Nero, so we'll mention that. Uh, it's not nearly as exciting as really anything Byron drove, but so it goes. Um, he also has been driving the Lexus GS. This is probably for the final time. But we're going to actually include that in the news segment, where we're also going to talk about General Motors and its deal to make the uh, the Badger with Nikola kind of interesting. Speaking of EVs, we'll talk Lucid. Maserati revealed uh, earlier this week. And then the Lexus GS is, again, toast. We'll get Byron's sort of final take on that. Then one thing I threw on here, this is a random segment. We've been doing all sorts of random segments. We'll see if we have time for it. But we're going to call it Things I Have a New Respect For. Byron didn't even put anything on there. So that means you get to just do it freestyle. Throw something right. on there and whatever comes to mind and away we go. But let's jump right in. Tell me about this Mustang you were driving. So, uh, yeah, GT350R, which it turns out this might actually be kind of a send off for that, too, because Ford hasn't actually confirmed whether we're going to get the GT350 going forward now that we're getting the uh, Mach 1 revival. So that's based on the 5 liter and not the wonderful 5.2 um, I mean, that engine just makes the car. It really defines it. I mean, the R is the track car. It's the sticky tires and the just unbelievable road holding. But without the engine, it's just, it's not the same. It's it's such a strange Mustang to drive because even the 5 liter revs quite a bit. But going from a 5 liter to this engine, you will just naturally short shift it all the time because it won't occur to you just how much of the rev range is left. I mean, that thing screams and it just goes forever. You will, I, I guarantee you, if you get into one of these and you're just puttering around from stoplight to stoplight, you will be shifting out of first gear thousands of revs before you should be because there's just so much ceiling in that engine. Um, it's wonderful. It's, I mean, it's my dream Mustang. I, I love the GT 500s. I always have, I, I have a soft spot for the 2012, 2013, whenever it was when they did the send off edition for Carroll Shelby or it was, you know, 200 mile an hour and all that good stuff. Those are wonderful cars. They're incredibly powerful. They make great noises, but it's really hard to compare to the GT 350. It's just such a wonderful experience for every one of your senses and it's also just really fast and capable, too. I mean, there's not an on-ramp alive that that thing can't do at double whatever the posted limit is. It's just insane. I'm impressed, too, just the fact that I've always felt, let me put it this way, I've always felt that the 350 is enough like Shelby Mustang for me. Uh, don't get me wrong, I love the 500. I've driven a couple different versions of them just over the course of, like, you know, its existence. I don't know. For me, the 350 was just, it was like the right balance of power and then other adjustments, if you will, enhancements, refinements for the Mustang. I always felt like the 500 was almost just like, we're going to take everything we do for the 350 and then add like a hundred more horsepower, at least, that the car doesn't really need, you know? Yeah. So when I think of a Mustang, I think more of a thing that it has some agility. It's also kind of raw, although they've been fine tuning it a bit in its more recent generations, the last couple, especially. 
Uh, but all that horsepower is more like, to me, like straight line speed. And when I think of Mustangs, I don't necessarily think of that, except for like maybe the Cobra Jet, you know, like drag racing pack or something. But yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, for me, that 5.2 liter flat plane crank uh, is just, that engine just got me so excited when they like rolled it out. So, you know, I, I hope this isn't the end of the line for the 350, in my opinion. I think it has a certain amount of cachet that I would hate to see the Mustang lineup lose. That being said, the Mustang lineup's getting pretty big right now. You know, you yeah. mentioned all the other ones in there. If you want to throw the Mach E in there, technically, um, yep. Mach 1, I mean, go up and down the lineup, the 500, which if you're listening to this, we're going to have a nice feature video on that coming up um, probably next week. So if you're listening to this over the weekend, be sure to come back for that. But there's a lot of Mustangs out there right now. Do you think there's too many? Uh, there might be just in this very moment with the with the Mach 1. I don't even know. I'm not even sure those are on dealer lots yet. I think they're 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 coming. Um, and then, of course, I mean, if, if this is the swan song for the GT350, then... If they don't overlap, then that solves a little bit of that. But yeah, I mean, between the EcoBoost High Performance, the GT Performance Package 1 and 2, the GT350, the Mach 1, GT500, and then, of course, all the random tuner ones like that Roush uh, edition that I drove a few weeks back. Like, there's there's a Mustang for every human being out there at this point. And honestly, I mean, as much as I, I love the GT350R as a concept, like the idea of having the rear seat delete and the sport cup two tires which are absolutely insane it's really way too much car for the street the the regular gt350 is is the sweet spot if you're actually going to drive it if it's going to be a track car go for r it there's just there's no question um but for for everyday driving a regular gt350 is amazing because you get the engine you get the magna ride suspension you get all the things that actually make the gt350 special the R is just, you know, it's the, the 911 GT3 RS versus just a 911 GT3. It's it's that kind of situation. And for a car that you want to live with, you actually want to put some miles on, the GT350 is really the sweet spot. It's actually, I mean, it's a heck of a lot more affordable, too, because you're paying $10,000 for the tires and the rear seat delete and all that kind of stuff. So... I mean, with my money, the regular GT350 is the one to get, and that actually makes the Mach 1 a really enticing proposition, because even though it won't have the 5.2, it'll just have the regular 5 liter, that's still a great engine. And sure, so you're going to be down 85 horsepower or whatever it is, I don't recall off the top of my head, you're still getting a heck of a lot of car. Granted, a loaded up performance package 2 or Mach 1 is still a fairly expensive Mustang, so there's some give and take there. But yeah, there are a lot of them. And I mean, honestly, I'm kind of surprised there are that many variants considering it's not selling incredibly well. I mean, the Challenger seems to be the only one that's kind of immune to fluctuations in customer habits. Um, the Camaro and the Mustang are not so fortunate. But I mean, I, I'm just thankful they exist because there are so many great enthusiast options out there. And especially for American buyers, that hasn't always been the case. Well said. Uh, tell me about the all road. Which one was were you driving? So this was a it was a fairly loaded one. They didn't actually give me a window sticker, but it's the uh, the A six all road and it had the uh, twin turbo six cylinder engine. Uh, I, I want to say I, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head. It's like three hundred and sixty five horsepower somewhere in that ballpark. Um, I mean, it's a nice, big, comfortable wagon. It's not. I wouldn't say it's particularly fun to drive. Uh, it's, it's powerful and punchy. I mean, it'll do zero to 60 in 5.1 or something like that. Like, you know, getting off the line, it's plenty of vehicle, but it's definitely a big, rugged kind of one size fits all family hauler of a luxury car. It's not, you know, a hunkered down sport wagon. The, even in the, the firmest and lowest setting, that suspension is not particularly firm. <laughs> it's just... You know, it, it takes the, the kind of the softer edges off of it a little bit, but it, it doesn't harden it all that much. Um, it's pleasant. It's a great cruiser. But uh, honestly, I was driving that back to back with the Mazda, and I actually enjoyed driving the Mazda on the freeway more than I enjoyed driving the Audi, which might ruffle some feathers. But, uh, you know, with gun to my head telling me which one I'd rather put, you know, a thousand mile road trip behind me in. I'm picking the Mazda, believe it or not. What'd you do with the Mazda? I'm curious. 
I used it to uh, finally unload the last of the items I had in my storage unit. So I actually did the same thing with the Audis. I, I had them at the same time, and uh, uh, I had them over a weekend. I took one on Saturday, one on Sunday, and just emptied that unit out. Um, the All Road swallowed three sets of wheels, one of them without tires, the other two with tires. And the CX-9 did a whole interior from a Ford Fiesta ST, and then another set of wheels. So both of them were, were, you know, when they're in cargo mode with the second row folded down and, you know, all my furniture blankets everywhere to protect all the interior pieces, they fit plenty of stuff. The CX-9 actually, it's known as, like, one of the less capable three-row crossovers. It doesn't have a ton of cargo room by default, um, at least compared to the other kind of mainstream competition. But... Once you drop both rows of seats in the back, there's plenty of room back there for just about anything you'd want to throw in. And it, it held more stuff than the all-road did, which kind of surprised me, even though they're both technically midsizers. Um, the all-road with the big uh, six-cylinder engine, unfortunately, is actually heavier, and I think that contributed to it being not quite as engaging to drive. Um, even though dimension-wise, they're about the same size, the CX-9 is a little taller and a little wider, believe it or not. Um, on the wider thing, not the taller thing. Obviously, you expect a crossover to be taller than a wagon. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's more spacious. It's lighter. Uh, it's more athletic. It just lacks the power that the Audi has. I think the all-road um, definitely has sort of the style. But then, if you want a little bit more of the, the capability and the substance, you would go for a larger crossover, like like the Mazda you mentioned. I think... Right. All roads are fun to drive. Don't get me wrong. We had an A6 all road, I want to say, uh, a little while ago. Uh, it was part of like, it was like a short long termer. We had it for like six months or something. And people loved it. It was beautiful. Um, got a lot of miles. But the trick was you couldn't really do as much as you wanted with it, if that makes sense. Like when you were going to go up north or something or go like away for the weekend, I mean, you would fill that thing like to the gills. And then yeah. it was like, Two people, okay, you're probably fine. Add a dog in, add a kid in, like, you know, you can do it. You can do anything if you really want to when it comes to, like, car travel with, like, vacations. But it's like, how can you do it easily? And wasn't the best thing, for sure. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's a very versatile car, especially since you, know, you do have the, the dynamic ride height and all that kind of stuff. You can actually take it off-road. I'd be more comfortable taking that on, like, a... A dirt track or something like that than I would the Mazda. I mean, I have I've actually t off roaded in a CX five before, and that did better than I expected it to, especially with the really front or really low front overhang on it. Um, so the CX nine is probably similar in that regard. But I mean, if you you know actually told me like, hey, this is kind of a rough trail back to the cabin or whatever, yeah, give me the all road for that because you get the ground clearance, you get the the air suspension. That's I mean, those are game changing when it comes to that kind of thing. So let's talk about the Kia Nero, which is what I drove. And, um, you know, it was okay. It was fine. It's, um, I would say it's very understated, if you will. Like, uh, nobody would look at that and think, oh, wow, that's this hybrid that you could get like 50 miles to the gallon with, you know? It just looked like a Kia crossover in a nice way. Looked good. You know, it was handsome. Nothing wrong with it. Anything like that. But it did not really stand out. And I sort of feel like, I don't know. I like it if you buy a hybrid and you want to maybe make a statement. You know, maybe that's a little over the top, but I mean, and there's nothing wrong with being understated or being modest, that sort of thing. But I still feel like the market, like just saturation is not there as far as buying either hybrids or electrics that I think a lot of buyers might want people to know, hey, I bought a hybrid. There's not, there's nothing about this car that makes you even not screams, whispers, hybrid, you know, it's just, it's there. Um, but it was, it's very fuel efficient. I, uh, uh, I actually did a lot of highway driving with this one, which is not really the thing you want to do with a hybrid as far as like really fuel sipping, but it was good. Um, I think different spurts I was seeing like well over 40, I saw 41, 42. Um, excuse me. I actually, it's rated more at like 52 in the city. And then on the highway, it's 49 for a nice 50, a neat 50 combined. Um, so yeah, it's efficient. Um, 
anecdotally it was getting around that. Mine actually cost uh, about $34,000 and Kias are great at giving you like almost everything. You know, for $34,000, a Kia is like an S-Class almost as far as features, you know. They really, it's a great value. You pay a reasonable price and you get a lot. I'm not sure this car felt like a $34,000 car, so there's that. They call it a crossover, uh, and they say it's got, uh, let's see if I can find it, 54.5 cubic feet of cargo room, just going by the website. I put a lot of stuff in there. I put a cooler in there. Uh, we did a picnic, um, went across town, hung out with my brother's family, and did a picnic, took some toys and like a, a ball for the kid. So like it did like literally everything that you would say, oh, hey, what are you going to do with your Kia hybrid crossover? Well, that's what I did, but I did still find it a little boring. Um, granted, in the last few weeks, I've had a McLaren, a GLC AMG 43. Um, I've got an Alpina in the driveway right now. I will admit, and I purposely tried to frame my reference here, that this is what it is and not to be like, you know, projecting anything onto it. Um, right. Which this is a job. You got to put this up against, you know, its competitors. Uh, in which case it's very competitive, but I mean, it definitely wasn't a car. I woke up and was like, boom, got to go drive the Nero. Um, <laughs> so, so there's that. Yeah. I haven't driven the Nero. I, uh, it, it's just a weird blind spot in my driving experience, but I think just, I mean, looking at it, I think I'd rather have one of those in my driveway than a Sportage just based on the looks. Okay. And the Spurge is pretty old at this point too. Like it's, I think it's it's due for a replacement like this year. Uh, I I'm I'm kind of pulling that out of thin air, but it it feels right. I mean, all of those Hyundai and Kia crossovers, it feels like are in some stage of replacement at this point. We're getting a new Tucson. We just got a new Santa Fe, and the Santa Fe and the Sportage should theoretically be the same platform and everything. So I would think Sportage has got to be right around the corner. Yeah, I think um, I, Kia does a good job of making design statements generally. Um, so, I mean, I think maybe they can lightly spice up their crossover lineup with this next batch of refreshes. I think that could help. Um, even the Soul, I think, got a little maybe duller this time around, probably by design. Because remember when it first launched back in like 08, it was basically like competing with the Honda Element, the Nissan Cube. It was a different marketplace. Now yeah. it's really, I think, matured into this like crossover that's more conventional, but it's it's gotten duller. So I don't know. That's our little tangent on Kia crossovers. Any other thoughts on all those way more interesting things that you've driven? No, I think uh, that's probably it for those. We'll have the uh, the first drive for the all road up here pretty soon, and uh, I'll have the. Uh, road test for the gt350 r following not too long after that so we'll uh, have those here in the next couple weeks for you guys so if you're following along with uh auto blog uh, i'm actually looking at our features calendar you we got some cool stuff that driveway test coming up coming up soon uh speaking of decadent cars i've been driving i drove the nsx a while ago and i finally have gotten that over the goal line that'll be coming up next week XC90 buying guide. Anything you want to know about that Volvo, be sure to check that out. So yeah, man, we know why you guys read Autoblog. It's for these car reviews. So we'll have we'll have plenty of them coming up. Let's talk some news though. Uh, it's been a pretty busy week, I think. Um, the one that immediately like kind of just surprised me was General Motors buying, investing in Nikola. Uh, it's a $2 billion stake. And they will build the Badger, which I think is a great name. I love that name. It's a yeah. hydrogen electric pickup. Um, I think that's going to be great, um, at least potentially for General Motors and for Nikola. Uh, but we're not going to see it till the end of 2022. Uh, so this, I don't know. I, I didn't see or hear much about this deal happening ahead of time. Maybe you did. But this seemed to be a little bit out of left field as far as I could tell. And... Um, you know, at first I was a little like, well, what is General Motors exactly getting out of this? Um, but, I mean, I think it could be a win-win, and I'm interested to hear what you think. Yeah, I feel pretty much the same way. I mean, it, it just kind of managed to sneak up on me, and it seems like 
everybody's looking for their dance partners in this EV space right now. And so, you know, Ford and Rivian have their tie up, which is on, I'm not going to say shaky ground, but it's been influenced by coronavirus related issues. Uh, it cost them their first Lincoln EV crossover just because they couldn't make it all work out. But they're saying, don't worry, that that relationship's still intact and more things are going to happen. What are they going to say, right? You know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like, oh, darn it. Guess, guess we missed out on that one. Wow, that was strike three. Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, and then, so now we've got this with uh, GM, and it, it kind of makes you wonder, like, where FCA slash Stellantis will land, who their, who their buddy will be. Because it seems like everybody's got one now, at least one, if not more than one. So um, it's going to be a, an interesting couple of years, I think, especially as all these startups try to find someone to either buy them out or invest in them to give them the money they need to scale up, which is the big challenge for all these things. I mean, it's, you know, it, it, it's not like tech where you can say, oh, yeah, I want to make a phone. OK, fine. Scaling up for a. Uh, Automotive production is a slightly different ballgame, so it's going to be interesting to see how it shakes out for everybody. I think what's interesting here, a couple of kind of like footnotes. Um, Steve Gursky, who is a former vice chairman of General Motors, is um, part of the Nikola Corp, if you will, uh, corporation. So that's just an interesting like side note. Like you starting to see whose Rolodex, uh, like you know, all the right phone numbers were in here. Um, Nikola stock is worth more than general motors stock, which to me is insane. When you think yeah. about just how EV stocks are worth, they're like pure gold, they're platinum. Like you could literally have no like way to support your business plan other than it's just like in a theoretical academic sense. Like I could come up with a business plan, put it in a spreadsheet and say, this is what's going to happen. Will it? Eh, probably not. That's not the way the world works. But I mean, investors love that. So, I mean, I don't know. I'm almost a little flabbergasted by this optimism. Tesla stock is through the stratosphere. Um, I was a little surprised about Rivian too. To me, that was one that it was like, you know, they, again, they had like this, like, they didn't even have the business model. Whereas I feel like at least the Badger and Nikola, there's a little bit of like steak to go with the sizzle, if you will. Rivian, yeah. it seemed like they're, like founder and CEO RJ Scaringe was doing a bunch of maybe I mispronounced that Scaringe was doing a bunch of like interviews and it just seemed like they were like almost picked off because they were like the name and then Amazon was investing in them and it was just kind of like you know John Snyder who's our green editor and I have been on the podcast multiple times being like what was it about Rivian that like made everybody think they had the secret sauce for a minute you know um, so I don't know but I mean. It, it is a little mind blowing when you look at the stock prices for these. And then you look at like General Motors, which has actually been doing this stuff for 120 years, but their stock's 31 bucks. And then like a company that didn't exist five years ago is 46. Yeah. But they know what they're selling. They know how to articulate that plan. So, yeah. so it goes. And I think the Badger is cool too, just as a side. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. I agree with that. And I, you know, it's, it's been kind of a, a week for EV things too, because we had the, the this will segue nicely into the Lucid co uh, conversation, but you know we've got these companies that seem to be right on the cusp of launching effectively, like hard launching, actually producing a tangible product. And this is make or break for so many of them too. And I mean, you have to imagine that without the the investment from GM, Nikola would have nowhere to go. Um, I mean, Lucid's in a great position because they've got experience with the tech. They've got it's. Their battery and charging technology has already been proven in Formula E, and that's a pretty good feather to have in your cap, you know? So it's it's interesting to see them, like, just on the cusp of striking out and maybe actually having a legit production car to show us in the next couple months. And especially with so many of these other outlets still being vaporware, and even the ones we really like. I mean, Rivian is a good example. Like, they're they're theoretically chugging along behind the scenes, but there just hasn't been much tangible to show for it lately. Um, and same is true of Bollinger. Like, they've got their prototypes. We haven't actually seen evidence of the next steps. They've got their new production facility and all that kind of stuff. Like, the, it seems like it's coming together, but 
they're still not at the actual production phase of anything yet. And that, that story just seems to repeat. And it's the kind of thing that people saw in tech for, um, it still happens in tech. Even, you know, big companies like NVIDIA, they launch a new graphics card. They launch it, and it's still a month and a half before you actually see the darn thing. So, you know, even the established guys tend to go in that direction. And it's it's not the, the most pleasant one. I don't think anybody likes to hear an announcement for a product that they can't buy. So it'll be interesting to see if there's a correction in that regard over the next few years as customers get sick of hearing about things that don't exist. I, uh, you know, the more, when I look at these different groups, Lucid, I think has a lot of, um, you know, just, it seems like they have a lot going on as far as like, you know, you mentioned, uh, formula E, like, I feel like there's enough there to say, oh, this is a credible company. Whereas some of the other ones, I, I don't know, I'm a little more skeptical about, you know, Peter Rawlinson, uh, has got a lot of different, you know, experience in the car business. Uh, so. When I look at them, if I were a car company, I'd say, well, hmm, maybe there's somebody we want to try and buy into and try to get some sort of, you know, competency from them. Um, the downside is, is right now they're doing sedans. Uh, they have hinted that there's right. other things they're going to do. And right now, if you're like, well, hmm, Nikola, oh, they're doing a truck. Sweet. Let's go with them. Whereas Lucid is doing, you know, kind of like a Model 3, Model S fighter. You know, I don't know. If you're General Motors, maybe you take your chances as far as like coming up with an electric sedan. But somebody's doing an EV truck, you might want to try and jump at that. I don't know. I mean, part of me also yeah. is a little confused about why these legacy automakers do want to poach, like if you will, or pick off these like startups. Because like then you're like almost competing with yourself. Like your yeah. GM, now you're selling, what about a Chevy Colorado that could be hypothetically electric? That seems like a great idea to me, or a hybrid Colorado. But then there's the Badger, you know? It seems like it's going to bite right. into the Colorado. I mean, I got to say it, right? I mean, I don't know. The Badger also makes me think of Big Ten football, Wisconsin, the Badgers. Um, random mm. thoughts that pop into my head there. Um Ah, uh, football. That's football. Um, <laughs> there will be, so if you're listening to this, we're recording this on a Thursday. I believe the NFL is coming back tonight. Uh, yes. So there'll be stuff, there's more stuff to watch on TV, let's put it that way, for you sports fans out there. Uh, but we should also talk about Maserati. They revealed their mid-engine supercar, really, I would say. I'm not going to say this is a sports car. It's the MC20. Um... I think it's gorgeous. It's impressive. Um, we've been hearing and seeing teasers, rumors about this for years. This is essentially a reset for the Maserati brand. Um, they're no longer that sort of in-between step between Elf and Ferrari, which is, if you think about it, there's a lot of room between Elf and Ferrari um, in the FCA sort of empire. Ferrari has been spun off. Um, although they're still somewhat in the orbit of FCA or Stellantis. Um, I don't know. What do you think of this thing? MC 20, man. I mean, it's a, it's a much more exciting 4C in my mind. I mean, it's obviously it's much larger. It's not really a competitor to the alpha 4C, but it uses a lot of the same concepts because the, the 4C is like a baby supercar. It's like the, the Italian take on a Lotus Elise with a little more sex appeal, I think would be the way to look at it. Like the Elise is a very function over form, you know, simplify and add lightness, all that good stuff. And the 4C makes that a little bit more refined, but not that much more, which I think is actually why it didn't sell very well, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, so this is obviously like, you know, this is cranking it up a significant amount. I mean, you're talking about 600 plus horsepower, uh, the price tag to get a match like it's a lot of car i don't i mean i don't get too excited about it though i mean it's weird to see a launch like this that isn't electrified straight out of the gate i mean they're talking about electrification plans it's coming and all that but everybody else's flagship super and hyper cars are utilizing electrification to some degree and even lamborghinis using super capacitors and stuff like that to get a little boost here and there like there's there's a little more high techiness to some of the other reveals we've seen, and by those standards, this feels very FCA to me. 
Like, just like, you know, FCA doesn't have an electrification partner, <laughs> and FCA supercars don't have electrification. So, it's on brand, if nothing else, I suppose. Yeah, it looks like, so one of our contributors, Ronan Glan, did a really nice series of stories on this and the Maserati compact crossover, which, believe it or not, is also a thing. Um, what I think is interesting here is that I'm a little confused as to what market they're exactly going after. Because again, it's like, this seems like an amazing reveal for 10 years ago. Like now yeah. they do say they do hint and Ronan reports this, that electrification is like this vehicle is capable of electrification is what I'm trying to say. So like maybe there is more to come. And truthfully, if you're in the market for something like this, like, let's just say you're like, I don't know, Justin Verlander or somebody like a famous celebrity athlete who likes cars, by the way. That's why that name popped into my head. Yeah, you probably look awesome. at this car and you probably say to yourself, well, I'm also going to get, I don't know, an NSX, which has like some sort of hybrid, you know, element to the powertrain. Okay, I don't care that I'm going to burn a little more fuel with the Mazer, you know, like. I can see that. Like, I don't necessarily think somebody's going to go like, whoa, this car is not, you know, you know, it's blowing a hole in the ozone layer. <laughs> but right. just from like a, a technical prowess perspective, it's a little odd not to have that, not to at least be able to say it could go 10 miles on electric range or you get that electrical boost. It just, it seems kind of like odd not to do it, even if you do it in a nominal way. That being said, Sometimes it's companies do it and you're like, what was the point of that? You know, like you didn't get any real extra performance out of it that you could have gotten using, you know, traditional components. Right. So, I mean, I don't know. Considering it's Maserati, I'm actually okay with that simply because, I mean, it's an Italian car. Let's make it sound good. Make it look good. I'm Italian. That's enough for me, you know? Yeah. So. No, I think that's a solid take. And, it, and there really are two sides to the electrification coin. You're right. And honestly, I mean, it's funny, like, I look at this, this is exactly what I expect from Maserati, and that's okay. But at the same time, there are no Maseratis that I genuinely get that excited about. So, I mean, they exist, and they're cool, but nine times out of ten, I just want an Alpha for the same or less less money most of the time you know like i would i would rather be seen in the alpha i would rather drive the alpha the maserati is cool for that you know tier one kind of cachet but i don't know i don't i don't get that that fizz you know like i don't get excited when i look at one i'll be intrigued to see what what else is coming with maserati um you know, we I mentioned that crossover, which check it out. It's on our site. Um, not much to say other than they're just trying to, you know, flesh out their lineup a little bit. I'm not necessarily sure Maserati even needs to do that, but so it goes. I drove the Levante a couple of years ago out at Pebble Beach, the GTS, the, the Trofeo version with the Ferrari engines in them. I mean, they're all Ferrari engines basically, but um, and that's very nice crossover. Uh, it rides, drives yeah. really well, looks the part. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I guess I, I will say this, like the Julia is a gorgeous car. You know, I think that's better looking than anything like the Ghibli, which I guess is probably the smallest Maserati sedan. So it's like, I would agree with you. If you're like cross shopping Italian, like, you know, niche marks, you know, Alpha wins head to head on in several critical areas. Side note about Alpha. I don't know if you have driven a 4C recently. I have driven one like two or three times in my life um, just because they don't exactly come through the press fleet on a monthly basis. Um, <laughs> right. We did what at our tech of the year testing back at like 2014. This is a while ago at Autoblog here. Drove one up north. Um, it was cold. It was like late October. It was almost like snowing. And they were like, do you want to drive this home? Because we had to drive the cars home. And I was like, yeah, I don't think I want to drive this thing home. It's like undrivable, <laughs> you know, and I ended up taking, I don't know, like a Volt or something. Um, I also drove one through downtown Manhattan one time. That was wild. Um, At least it's the right size for Manhattan. It's the right size. Uh, the visibility is not Although it's a little great. wide, I guess. You can't see too yeah. well. I'll admit that was kind of scary. And it was during a video shoot where the, like, the producers were directing me like into this like side area by the Manhattan Car Club. 
So literally, I was oh, driving oh. on the sidewalk at one point in the 4C. <laughs> oh, my God. This is insane. Um, yeah. I mean, this was multiple years ago. A Let's put it that car. Way. Yeah, I believe it. Anyways, enough on that. Uh, that's Maserati. Uh, speaking of luxury brands, you did drive the Lexus GS. But we're going to talk about here in the news yes. section. Because uh, it is like, it is dead for 2021. This is your final take. You could have another take if you want, but I just, what do you think? They're killing this car. Do you care? Uh, I do actually. I'm, I've got a soft spot for the GS. Uh, I've, I've never driven a variant of the GS that I didn't enjoy. Um, like granted, I haven't driven, I don't think just like a plain base spec. I guess the 350 is still the lowest level. I don't even recall off the top of my head. So the one I have is a, a 350 F Sport, so it's sportier version of the base car. And I I love the GSF. That's an amazing vehicle. Overpriced compared to the M5s and uh, E63s and such of the world, but still a great car in its own right because that V8's wonderful. Um, and the hybrid versions of this car have always been relatively fun to drive too. They, they're just, you know they're punchy. It's rear wheel drive. It's you know an old school take on luxury midsize sedan and it just works and especially since it's a lexus it literally just works like you know every day you go on you go in you press the button you drive away you don't ever really have to think about these cars and that makes them special in their own way too so i think it's a shame this is going away especially because what's likely going to replace it functionally is going to be an all-wheel drive version of the es and I think as auto riders were kind of obligated to look down on the ES because it's quote unquote just a Camry, but the the new ES is actually a very nice car, and they have gone out of their way to improve the chassis. It is actually fine to drive. I wouldn't say fun, but fine. And if they decide to get kind of tricky with it, maybe do a a, a hybrid with a little extra punch because they can you know they, they don't have to worry about the transmission being able to handle the power if they stick it all on electric motors on the rear axle or something like that and they've been they finally got confirmed i think very recently that the es is going to get all-wheel drive so that kind of brings that whole package together that's how they effectively replace the gs and the lexus lineup without actually replacing the gs which appears to be a non-starter so yeah i'll miss this one it, it'll it'll be a shame to see it go um at the same time, you kind of had the feeling for the past few years that Lexus was never very serious about keeping it around anyway. They saw the writing on the wall. They knew what they were doing. And while it was nice that we got the GSF while it was still around, uh, you could tell they didn't really have any plans for it beyond that. So, I took the GSF to Taco Bell maybe a year or two ago. Um, that was fun. It's my only take <laughs> on this. I've actually oddly been to a number of I feel like Lexus GS events, like they did like a facelift yeah. at the Chicago auto show. I think I had a cold. It was before coronavirus, so it probably wasn't coronavirus. Don't really have much more else to say about these cars other than the GSF was a heck of a heck of a car. Let's put it that way. I mean, really anything with that uh, V8 in it was, oh, yeah. I mean, to me, sure. Whatever that goes in, I was probably going to like it. But I mean, from a business yeah. standpoint, this I think this car's time has passed. Yeah, I mean, it's a real shame that the ISF didn't see a second generation. The RCF is neat, but you have to want what's effectively a luxury pony car yeah. to drive that thing, because that's what it is. And the ISF at least gave you four doors and, I mean, a, a nod toward comfort and, and convenience that you don't really get from the RCF. And the GSF was just like, oh, well, we can make an ISF, but bigger which has penalties and weight and all that kinds of things. So, you know, it, I miss the ISF. That was my ideal formula. But if I had to pick a second place, it would be the GS. I agree with you that so. ISF is probably number one, like on the grid here, as far as like making the Lexus sedans like hotter, if you will. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I'd agree with that ranking. I don't know. I guess I'm for me, I'm just kind of more like meh by GSF. So, yeah, that sort of thing. It, um. But it's it's significant, though, which is, hey, why we're talking about it. So something that's probably not significant, but I'm going to throw this out here. Um, we've had some random features on the podcast lately. We've done beer, which is a, one of my favorites. I think we need to do one of those. Maybe in a few weeks, we'll get a couple people back on the show and do like a fall beer podcast. Um, oh, I'm so here for that. Yeah, uh, it's... It's about time. What's your fall beer, by the way? Just curious. Do you have a go-to? 
my my go to for years and years and years has been just a good old fashioned Sam Adams Oktoberfest. Yeah. It's a great beer. It's always reliable. It always tastes great, and it, it shows up that first week of August. And in most years, that would be right before NFL preseason starts. So you have August. You've got your first fall beers. You've got NFL preseason. It's like okay, it's turning into fall. It's it's about to happen. And so this year, I only got the Oktoberfest out of that deal, which is fine. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm usually good with just about any like pumpkin ale or something like that. You, fall is my season. This is what I, this is what I live for. Same here. It's uh, it was it's actually been pretty cool around here, around these parts. Uh, sometimes like it's I don't know, it's weird in Michigan. Like you get Labor Day, and the Labor Day was late this year, so all of a sudden it's like you know the first week after it, and it's like mid September. And like, there's a little bit of a crispness in the air this week, which I've been loving. It's been, yes, you know, it was down in the fifties. I think last night I'm actually wearing sweatpants right now, which it's been a little cooler, you know, temperatures get down there. There's a breeze. All of a sudden there's no humidity and you notice it. My beer is Bell's Amber Ale. That is to me like, oh, that's a good it's one. It's a solid beer. Good for November. I it's love a Bell's heavier. Amber. Yeah. Um, but it's okay. Earlier in the year, there's a shorts beer too. I think that's. Well, I can't think of it. It's like a pale ale, an autumn ale, something like that. It's really solid. It's got I'll like a look. like a leaf, a leaf on the a leaf. Geez, I know my singulars and plurals for the word leaf on the bottle, but that was good too. Uh, anywho, nice. I'll have to look for that. I've got to I've got to make a run tonight. It's my game night. Do, yeah, okay. Uh, socially distance games with uh, my friends from back in Cleveland. So. Oh, there you go. All right. It's very socially distant. We're 180 miles apart. Okay. All right. Well, hey, I, you know, we'll give a shout out to our friends of the Yahoo ecosystem. You can watch tonight's game. It's uh, what? Chiefs Texans. Is that right? Uh, oh, man. I actually don't have that. In I front believe of me. you can I watch should. that game on different Yahoo platforms streaming. Check out our friends at Yahoo Sports. Um, so, yeah, I'll give a plug over to them. Uh, yeah. Houston, Kansas. That's a great game, game too. I So yes. it's getting really late, too. I need to join a fantasy football league. I am a little surprised. I, that's actually how I knew what the thing was. Is I just pulled it up and I'm, I'm starting Pat Mahomes. You so, uh, you're going to win then because I'm in a good mood. Yeah, <laughs> that's like fantasy nonstop points right there. Um, yeah. So fantasy football is great. Point of the segment, though, is we totally go off the rails, was things that are better <laughs> than you remember. And I'm just going to make the case here briefly for the Fox Body Mustang. Um, growing up for people of a certain age, the Fox body Mustang was almost like, it was like a high school car. Uh, many people I knew drew, drove them. One of my best friends on cross country actually had one. It was a cool car. It was like, dude, you have a Mustang, you know? And it was old even then to be clear, not that old, but I mean, like the door was rusted and wouldn't open. And he like got rid of it and got like he got like an old Dodge Ram, like from the late seventies, which in hindsight, that was maybe even cooler than the Mustang. As I think about it, just based on what he did, but at the time it certainly wasn't. It's like, you're getting rid of your Mustang things you do in high school, as far as cars and, you know, getting different cars, you know, it's who's got the best car. It's anyways, but anyways, I think the Fox body Mustang is something that is going to maybe be appreciated more. I almost, when I came up with this, went with the like the next generation the fourth gen um which was from like 94 i think to oh four if i'm getting right one of my neighbors has a mach one which i think is pretty cool so i almost went with that but my point and this is why i'll back this up is those mustangs i think the third gen the fox body on those platforms a fox platform if you will to me, that car was legitimately muscular, especially for the 80s. It was a clean yeah. look. It was it wasn't blocky, but it like it was squared off. It's really a look that Ford before or since hasn't done with a Mustang. It's unique in that sense. Um, I actually liked some of the later ones where the front end, they kind of tweaked the headlights, made it look to me. It got more like almost timeless. Those late the late seventies, like it was 78, 79. And then the early eighties with the kind of angular headlights. I don't know that those to me are a little weird. And then of course the five Oh, you know, we were talking about Mustang engines earlier in the podcast. It was a solid engine, you know, um, yeah. even that, like there was like, I think, a L six, they called it, uh, off the Wikipedia, this, I think they called it a straight six. 
Oh, they did. It's actually literally in quotes on Wikipedia here. <laughs> For the 79 model year. Now I'm just reading from Wikipedia. But some of the engines were interesting, and you could get turbos. Um, I just think, considering like that second gen, you know, some people really love those, but I do think that's definitely a generation of Mustang where uh, there was a drop off from the early 70s and late 60s icons. You know, they it became something different. And to me, those yeah. Fox Mustangs really made the Mustang a little bit more like it could be um, and what it should yeah. be and what it should aspire to be. Uh, my parents had an 84, I want to say. Like, literally, it was the worst car they ever had. It went through, like, two transmissions, <laughs> and then they junked it. Um, total lemon. But it was so cool. It had the fastback, like, roof line. I remember I used to crawl through the trunk to get into it. Um, <laughs> so, you know, there was that. But I don't know make the case. I think the Fox body is underappreciated. I think they're going to be collectible at some point is people who are of a certain age start to get a little more nostalgic about this generation of cars. Like I think, you know, maybe I am right now. I mean, if you look at the Mustang in its current form, it's retro, it's more powerful, it's more sophisticated, better than it's ever been. There's like the Shelby GT 350 R we were talking about earlier, better than a Fox Mustang ever made on its best day for sure aesthetically performance wise but it's brand new and it's got the benefit of all of this development technology for its time i really think the fox body mustangs were pretty sweet yeah i'm with you on that i had a, a neighbor my immediate next door neighbor growing up had an 88 or an 89 gt convertible that he kept in immaculate shape he actually just recently passed and i don't know what happened to the car because my family has all moved out of the old neighborhood um but I drove by recently and saw that they'd redone the house, and of course the car was gone. So it, it's kind of a shame. But yeah, I mean, and the clean ones are actually starting to get expensive. I mean, if you want one that just hasn't been turned into that stereotypical high school car, um, you're starting to look at like fifteen, twenty thousand dollar entry. So there, people are noticing it's uh, it's it's catching on again, which I respect. Um, I don't, I don't know that I have a, a, I obviously didn't research this section for, for mine because I didn't put anything in our, our planning sheet here, but I actually, just to cheat, I actually think the CX-9 is, is one of the, the ones that I have kind of a, a renewed respect for, we'll say, because it's not that old of a vehicle, but just driving it this week, it's the first time I've driven one in four or five years and it's a crossover. So you never really have particularly high expectations for the way they drive, but it has just Maybe it's because I've driven a lot of Mazdas in my life and I'm used to the way they drive, but it's one of those cars where if I'm going down the highway in it, I can actually like look at the screen, look outside the window, and the car hasn't wandered away from me. You know, like that sensation you get sometimes in a car where like if you take your eyes off the road for an eighth of a second, there's so little feedback through the wheel that you can't tell that you've wandered out of a lane. And granted, everything these days has lane keeping and lane centering and all this other stuff, but even that is a distraction. So... It's really nice to get behind the wheel of a car that you can literally feel comfortable driving one-handed down the freeway without an ounce of thought dedicated to what the car is doing relative to what you feel. And to get that in a big family car like that really is special. I mean, they're just there there aren't even the luxury large crossovers aren't very good at that. So it was kind of a breath of fresh air to get in that, especially after like being in the all road and having to negotiate with all of its various electronic systems to get it to behave the way I wanted it to just to get out of the driveway to get in the CX-9 and have everything just kind of happen the way it should without having to think about it was really refreshing. So I'll cheat and use that as my newfound respect vehicle. I like it. I like it. And I like this show fast paced. Uh, we'll get you out of there. Uh, we'll get everybody else out of here uh, on their way to a great weekend. Enjoy your football. Enjoy your fall beers. Uh, of course, be safe about them. Byron, good catching up with you. Any final thoughts? Uh, no, not 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 a whole lot. Uh, I have I have no football teams to get excited about this year, so I've got no one to cheer. Although my Orioles, Greg can yeah. see that I'm wearing my uh, O's cap right now, might actually sneak into the playoffs in this ridiculously terrible short baseball season we're having. So that's the one thing I'm hyped for right now. I tell now. you what, it's mid-September and I'm still watching the Tigers and they're like in the range of 500. <laughs> they got blown out the other day. Right? But they've got some interesting pitchers. Like they're kind of doing what I want them to do, which is bring up the young players 
who are pretty good, see what they can do. Everybody else is playing okay. And I mean, it's interesting. It's something for me to do in August and September. And then, I don't know, maybe the Big Ten will start playing football later or something and I'll have more to watch. I don't know. Maybe I'll watch Notre Dame this week. That's not something as a Michigan State grad I'm used to watching, but we'll leave it there, I guess. All right. Again, that's all the time we have this week. Be safe out there. Um, If you enjoy the Autoblog podcast, please leave us a five-star rating. We're available on uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, wherever you get your podcasts. Until next time, 